Okay, we're gonna move straight into our second session. Welcome again to the inaugural Pan-African Youth Summit. The speakers for this session will focus on power, mobilization, ethics, security, and leadership. Our next speaker is Darcy Bourne, a 20-year-old sophomore with a joint major in sociology and French at Duke University in North Carolina. She will speak on the perspective of youth in diaspora. She is the peer ambassador for youths in diaspora. Now, unfortunately, she's unable to join us in person due to a national mission she had to do for her country, but she sent a message ahead. So here it is. Hello, I want to thank you for your participation in the Pan-African Youth Summit. It is a great honor to be an ambassador for youth in diaspora and to be in the company of our esteemed speakers. As the youngest speaker here and a qualified youth in diaspora, I want to share my perspectives about youth in diaspora. To get to know me briefly, I've always lived in England and I grew up in a biracial family in a predominantly white area and obviously a white country. I ended up competing for my national team in hockey a sport that is again, predominantly white. Due to this combination and the misfortune that most of my dad's family lived so far away, growing up, I didn't feel I was able to fully immerse myself in my black culture and heritage as much as I would have liked. Over the past few years, especially through conversation with other black people and biracial people, I've discovered that these challenges I encountered throughout my formative years are more common than I initially assumed. They are problems that deeply resonate with many black youth in diaspora. Often as black people in the Americas, Europe, or generally outside of the continent of Africa, we are the minority. We grow up surrounded by people who do not look like us, people we cannot completely relate to, and people that do not understand us. In countries such as America, black and African history did not start during slavery, as we are too commonly taught. And in the UK, it did not start during the Windrush generation. We, as black youth in diaspora, may not only feel as geographically disconnected, but we have been unable to ever experience the joys of our African culture fully. Oftentimes, we build walls of enmity, superiority, and inferiority among each other. We found ourselves isolated in a culture not created to support our success. And that can be an emotionally tasking experience to live through from generation to generation. I have good news though. Where we were once geographically displaced and disconnected, now with technology and social media, it is easier than ever to stay connected, learn to embrace our heritage, and continue the effort to excel anywhere we find ourselves in the world. Last year, I attended my first Black Lives Matter protest, holding my sign that says, why is ending racism a debate? I could have never imagined the impact of those six words with my photo at one of the protests. The photo and the message went viral. It was shared by ordinary people, by celebrities like David Beckham and 50 Cent, and by magazines like Vogue. It meant so much to me that I was able to reach people all around the world. But the most touching moment for me was when Martin Luther King III recognized my efforts by sharing the photo. No one could have meant more to me than Dr. King's son to have stood behind my message. At that point, I realized I was being heard and being seen. Most importantly, I realized I had been given the opportunity to impact those around me. And from that day onwards, I've been working my hardest to do exactly that in any way I could. I want to state categorically that our future depends on the youth. I truly believe that the future of our world is in great hands if bravery and leadership arise from the youth. To me, if the youth are not given the opportunity, the future looks bleak. It is important to note that the population growth of black youth exceeds other demography. So the subset of youth in focus has to be black youth. They are often overlooked and disregarded. The world leaders in their 40s, 50s, 60s, or even older. But I believe the necessary shift is coming. In fact, it is here. We have all seen over the past few years how the younger generations can and have taken the lead politically, rallying and beginning to come together to create real change. I have seen, experienced and embodied this type of youth leadership in the past few years in ways I was never taught to expect. My fellow youth, despite the challenges, I urge you not to underestimate your power. Take that first step, even if you think it may go unnoticed. Your voice, your step, and your action have the power to make a difference. Leadership and activism come in such different forms. It can be speaking up on a global platform, 
It can also be initiating those difficult conversations with friends and family. It incorporates educating ourselves and those around us. It involves peaceful protests. And ultimately, it is having the bravery to be vulnerable and using our voice to help those who cannot be heard and make a change in the world around us for the better, no matter how. Black youth in diaspora will continue to step up. In fact, we must step up and collaborate with our brothers and sisters on the continent to make the world a better place for all humans. God bless Pan-African youth from the continent of Africa to every corner of the world. Thank you. If you guys don't feel that, I don't know what you're going to feel. She is 20, 20 years old. I love it. I love it. Okay. At this junction, I am going to invite our next speaker. He is a French speaking native of Senegal, but he's going to be speaking to us in English. So be patient with our next speaker. He is phenomenal, but be patient because you will hear him. I've met him and he's a powerful speaker. Professor Babaka Kante, he's the president of the National Political Dialogue Commission in Senegal. He's the former vice president of the Constitutional Council and Court of Senegal, and an expert in constitutional law and political science. He will speak on ethics and power. Over to you, Prof. Hi, everybody. As you can feel it, my English is not so good, and uh, I do my best to say a few words in English about ethics and power. Uh, I would like to start to remind all these young people that we know for a long time that uh, power uh, tends to corrupt people. Uh, but for now, we can see in the continent that uh, uh, corruption is very high. And uh, when I see this kind of gathering, I have the feeling that uh, we can be hopeful uh, because we need to strengthen our skills to uh, behave ourselves to run these countries uh, nicely. And I think that uh, we need some conditions. Uh, first of all, instead of looking around and uh, doing exactly the same things, I think that these young people can uh, try to be very tough with themselves to focus on some basic values like dignity, uh, to be proud, and to think about what we are doing for your majority, for your city, uh, and uh, to be proud of what you achieve. And if you accomplish these conditions, I think that we can be uh, a very good leader. And I'm hopeful that uh, in the continent, uh, our future is very clear because my experience, to be frank with you, is not so positive. Uh, having teached for, for uh, 40 years, I can see that students are very, very good in criticizing the power when they are young. But uh, when they are on power, uh, in, on duty, they do exactly the same thing. I would like to warn them to avoid this behavior. So I think that if they uh, try to focus on their own dignity and uh, to be proud uh, to do things for the majority of citizens and to deal with uh, uh, specific questions. I think that we can have some young people running our uh, country for the future. These are the, some, some words I would like to say, some thoughts about uh, ethics and power. And I would like to, to thank you for inviting me to join you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Professor Kante. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know that power, as you said, it does corrupt and it's very hard to be in power and to remain uh, as sane as we want everyone to be. So anyway, um, at this junction, I am going to invite our next speaker. That is Dr. Alexandra Williams. She's an internal medicine physician at Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. Dr. Williams will speak on ethics. Hello, everyone. All right. So, when I took some time to think about ethics and medicine, I realized that most of our ethical dilemmas relate to decision making. And there are three main forms of decision making that I encounter on a daily basis. The first would be decisions that physicians make, with the last two being 
decisions that patients and their surrogates make. The first relates to specific training that we go through on how to be a physician, how to practice medicine, how to do no harm. The last two are a little more challenging because most patients do not have specific training in medical ethics. So it is in my hands to give them all of the information that I deem relevant to making the decision in front of them. When you take a moment to think about that, it is simultaneously an honor to be trusted in that way and heavy pressure to be somewhat of a spokesperson for the patient's body. I see myself as an interpreter of what the human body is trying to tell us, what it needs, what is abnormal, what is causing the pain. I then have to present that in a way that the patient will best understand while being clear about what modern medicine can and cannot do to return things to normal. This brings me to the part that you won't really see in any medical ethics framework. That's letting empathy be your guide. I found that when patients and their loved ones are aware that you have mentally turned the tables and really considered their situation from their point of view, it is much easier to help them navigate the decision-making process and proceed respectfully. While my expertise is medicine, ethics is relevant to every aspect of human interaction, particularly in the political climate of any given country. Similar to a good medical doctor, a president or leader of a nation should consider it a great honor to have the entire well-being of your nation entrusted to your care. For me, it's one patient at a time. For you, as current and future leaders, we are talking about millions and millions of lives. I am a young Black female physician. These three characteristics I am very proud of, but they do leave me vulnerable to doubt or biases. I share these same characteristics with many of you. Because of this, my life experience has been quite different than the majority of my colleagues. I've developed a type of hyper-awareness to biases of all sorts. While race and socioeconomic status can be relevant to health outcomes, they are most certainly not relevant in how I treat my patients. I can see parallels in that you might become the leader of a wholly diverse population and you will have to lead and represent them all equally. Their economic viability, among other necessities of livelihood, such as healthcare and food security, would be in your hands. You could see yourself as the physician of the country and the millions of people you serve. If you become the president of Nigeria, you are now the economic and social physician for over 200 million people. Take a moment to let that sink in. The all-encompassing physician of an entire nation, responsible for assessing all aspects of his health and subsequently responding appropriately. A massive responsibility by any standard, and more so if you want to do what is right for your people. Ethics is not about you, your feelings, your political affiliation, neither is it about your family or friends. Ethics is all about the good of the people you serve. If there's anything I want to leave with you, it is to continue, consider yourselves stewards of the social, economic, all-encompassing health of your country and to bear that responsibility ethically. It is a privilege to share the ethical considerations I incorporate into my professional life and an even greater honor to speak with the leaders of our generation and the ones to come. Thank you for having me today. She, she's another young speaker, okay guys? Okay, so I didn't tell you this at the beginning. Somebody was telling me that, okay, how come you have, you have the Pan-African Youth Summit and you have old people speaking? I'm not one of those old people, by the way. I don't know who they're referring to as old people. But anyway, on our speaker uh, panel today, we have two, 20 years, uh, two in their 20s. We have two in their 30s. And then the rest, I don't know their ages. They didn't tell me their ages. But at least half of our panelists are considered youth in my mind. And it's actually phenomenal to see what youths are doing and hearing them. Uh, I think this should encourage all the other youths that are here today. And Alex is calling you Madam President, Mr. President. That is phenomenal. I can see it. And I like that messaging. The president of a nation is the physician of that nation. President of a nation is the physician of the nation. So the well-being of your nation is in your hand. Okay, we're going to take a little break. I think you're going to enjoy this one as well. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmony of love Let our rejoicing rise high as the glistening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song. The dark past has taught us Sing a song Full of 
hope that gives me chills. That gives me chills. I literally mean that. Gives me chills. Oh, God bless that coin. All right. Our last but not the least speaker for the day is Professor Ivlo Lloyd Griffin. He is the senior associate with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. He's the former vice chancellor of the University of Guyana, president of Fort Valley State University in Georgia, provost of universities in Virginia and New York, and dean at Florida International University. He will speak on security, political economy of drugs, crime, and its impact. Okay. But let me take the opportunity while we get the screen the presentation set up to, to commend you for this summit and to thank the wonderful speakers that we've heard from so far, young and not so young, and I consider myself in the category of old young, young at heart, and to ask that we ensure that the words spoken here today become advocacy for tomorrow and beyond. I want to spend my five minutes focusing on something that has been eclipsed in the last year or so by the COVID conversation. And that is a worldwide challenge in relation to drugs. The map you have before you is a map, a maritime map of drug trafficking in the Caribbean. Drugs that go from South America through the Caribbean to Europe drugs that go from South America to Africa that come back to the Caribbean, it comes to the United States. But if you were to look at this map and think that this map represents the alpha and the omega of the drugs scourge, you'd be surely mistaken. When we go to the next slide, please, Francesca. Uh, and I'd ask you to put everything up on that slide. What this slide captures is a concept I coined a few decades ago, a concept called geonarcotics. What the concept says is that understanding the scourge of drugs requires that we take a holistic approach to the relationship between drugs and security. And that holistic approach requires that we appreciate that the problem of drugs, the scourge of drugs is not a one dimensional, it's not simply a trafficking matter. It's a matter where a component has to do with the production of illegal substances. It has a component dealing with trafficking, sometimes maritime, sometimes by air, sometimes across borders, sometimes using the human body. It's also a problem of consumption and abuse in some countries, and it's not simply the soft drugs like marijuana is the hard drugs like cocaine, methamphetamines, and the others. But an integral part of the phenomenon is the money laundering challenge, moving the ill-gotten gains from illegal environments to legal environments, using banks, using bodegas, using money, money shops of one kind or another. But I suggest in looking at the scourge of drugs, that it's important as well to understand and appreciate that there are several dimensions. The drugs problems of production, trafficking, money laundering, and so on, give rise to political, economic, environmental, as well as military issues. And those issues require that several different countermeasures. You know, there was a time when in the United States, uh, President Nixon had launched this quote-unquote war on drugs. Well, there was a bad messaging there, and ultimately, we came to understand that the war on drugs is not being productive. It's a futile effort, because military instruments by themselves and military implements alone cannot solve the problem. Some of what is required is required education. Some of what is required is legislation. Some of what is required is rehabilitation. And what is required also is a combination of national and international efforts, and national and international efforts on the part not only of states, of nation states, but of corporations, some of whom are the biggest beneficiaries of the drugs business, 
of nonprofit organizations, of international governmental and non-governmental organizations. And if we go to the next slide, I recommend that in looking holistically, you can put everything up, uh, Francesca. If we look holistically at the issue of drugs, even if only in one national or regional environment, in regional context, there is a global connectivity, there's a global interdependence, what is called the global. Some of the drugs phenomenon connected to producing uh, cocaine, for example, requires chemicals produced in different parts of the world entirely. We hear a lot about the cocaine produced in Colombia and Peru and elsewhere, but some of those chemicals come from Germany, some come from India, some come from the United Kingdom, and there is a local and glo lo global connection which requires us to think not only holistically in national context, but interdependence global context. Uh, the final slide is one in which I recommend that in looking at the drugs scorch, we appreciate in practical terms, this local global connectivity. And the fact that you may be in North Carolina does not mean that you are not connected to dimensions of the problems in Nigeria. The fact that you may be in Jamaica should not absolve your responsibility for understanding the connectivity between what happens in the Caribbean and what happens in Europe. And so my message is simply as, as we think of the youth, of, as we think of leadership, as we think of the tomorrows, we need to appreciate the local global connections of the phenomena such as the drug scourge, which if we don't control appropriately, will undermine the ability of our nations and our people to live and to prosper. I wanna thank Francesca sincerely for this opportunity to share a few thoughts. That really hits, it hits home. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Griffith, for that. Guys, especially for those of you youth that are aspiring to be leaders of your nation, what you just heard from Professor Griffith, though a very sore uh, topic, it is reality. For your nation to survive, we're talking about the so sovereignty of a nation. For your nation to survive, you need to understand these things. It's not just enough to become the president or the prime minister. You need to understand the, the connection, the interconnectivity that Prof just talked about. In addition to all the other obvious things, we wanna take you a little bit deeper into those other areas that you never think about. It's not even your area of expertise. So you wouldn't know, you don't, I mean, what is that supposed to mean? Why do you need to care about drugs? Whether you do or you don't, guess what? It is there. So it's important for you to know it. I am going to invite uh, the person uh, in the name of Paul Williams. He is a global supply chain expert. He's going to share the next steps with us after this summit. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, what a great historic event. Um, thank you, Dr. Fajimi, for organizing. You said earlier that the song gave you chills. I have to tell you, like, this whole summit um, has given me chills. Um, you know, as, as a supply chain leader, I, I travel around the globe linking resources to needs, right? And I, um, I always try to find or connect with the African diaspora. Uh, you find us in uh, all around the world where the global majority, as, you, as someone else said, you find us in places that you would not expect, like China or Poland. And, I, and one of the things that I realized is that no one, no group has more intellectual, political, and economic potential than the youth of the African diaspora. And so uh, seeing this historic event where everyone has come together today, um, it, it just gives me chills. Um, you know, similarly, the cultural influence around the world is also good. So I just say to the youth, um, connect your power and the world is yours. You can r r run this thing. <laughs> I am very, very pleased to announce the next major endeavor that the organization is barking on for global African youth, um, which is to continue developing the global African youth in and perpetuity 
a $1 billion, with a B, $1 billion endowment for sustainable global African youth development will be initiated. The five areas that it will focus on are education and skill acquisition, health and well-being, employment and entrepreneurship, leadership and governance, global partnerships and collaboration. And so everyone from all around the world, all corners of the world, should have a stake in elevating global African youth. So please uh, log on to yourblackmatters.com and express your interest. And I thank you in advance for giving our youth a chance. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Paul. Well said. I'm going to stop right here. I want to tell you how much we truly, truly appreciate you. I want to thank all the locations that opened their doors for us to be able to have this historic summit. I think for all our speakers today, you know that they came on with passion. You heard Reverend Sharpton. He came on with passion. He said, how dare you not? How dare you not do anything? Whether you're in the diaspora, you're on the continent of Africa, how dare you sit back and wait for somebody to dictate your future? We must not sit back and let people dictate our future. You heard all the speakers, distinguished speakers today. You know what? There's not much I can tell you other than this is phenomenal. It's awesome that you're part of it. I want to thank you for being part of this glorious event. And all I can say is go and make the change that you desire. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you all. God bless the Pan-African youth. God bless all Black people, Black race. God bless you all. Thank you so much for coming. Have a lovely one. Bye-bye.